been 40 years. Time for some self-induced nostalgia. Let's return to late November 1950 and Columbus, Ohio. For as long as folks gather to talk about the unforgettable moments in football, they will hearken back to that last Saturday in November of 1950, to the Michigan-Ohio State game that will forever be called the Snow Bowl. On the eve of the game, the awfulest snow and ice storm since 1913 literally paralyzed the Midwest. Temperatures plunged to record lows. It was the kind of weather one said that would make sled dogs go on strike. But the game would go on. The two teams punted 45 times, 10 times on first down. Ohio State had the only three first downs of the game. Amazingly, though, there were but four turnovers. But perhaps the most amazing statistic is that out of the nearly 83,000 tickets sold, more than 50,000 people actually showed up in that huge gray horseshoe built alongside the Olentangy River in Columbus. By the time the game started, just 30 minutes late, the mercury was near zero. The snow was driven by brutal winds whipping in from the northwest, sometimes at 30 miles an hour. With the game just a few minutes old, Vic Janowitz gave Ohio State the lead with a field goal from the 28-yard line. It was set up when Ohio State blocked Chuck Ortman's punt, and Bob Momsen, one of two brothers playing on opposite sides, recovered at Michigan's eight-yard line. But Michigan blocked a Janowitz punt for a safety just six minutes later. The snow was coming down in such abundance that seeing the yard lines was quickly out of the question. From the press box, the goings-on below were little more than rumors. A modest man given to understatement, the then Wolverine coach, Ben Osterbaum, almost apologized for winning, saying it surely was no test of football skill. The other Momsen decided the issue that bleak day, breaking through the block Janowitz punt and then recovering the ball in the end zone. Harry Alice's conversion made it 9-3, and that's the way it finished. With Northwestern upsetting heavily favored Illinois that day, a Michigan team that had won but two of its first six games that season sort of sneaked into the Rose Bowl and then won it. University of Michigan marching band train pulled out of Ann Arbor on a cold and wintry morning, headed for California sunshine and the Rose Bowl football classic. On board the 16-car special, lives of Buick, sponsors of the trip, faculty personnel, and 150 Michigan bandsmen. The train sped rapidly westward into the warmth and sunshine of the Southwest. One stop was made on the way, the parade at Albuquerque, New Mexico. After playing a few selections in front of the railroad station, the band paraded and performed along Albuquerque's main streets. After the parade, a box containing some hot Mexican food along with a key ring and an Indian good luck charm was given each bandsman by Queens from the nearby University of New Mexico. These were the first of many souvenirs to be gathered on this 10-day tour of the West. Back on the train, the band members spent most of their time gazing at the snow-capped Rocky Mountains and basking in the southwest sunlight. Another beautiful day greeted the band as it arrived in Pasadena, California the following afternoon. A crowd of more than 2,000 people gathered to see and hear the nationally famous musical organization. In the parade that followed, the Californians were treated to the quick step and stirring music that earned the Michigan band the title of Best in the Land. On all street parades, the famed conductor of the University of Michigan band, Professor William D. Ravelli, marched with the men. After the parade to the city hall and a short concert there, the band members boarded chartered buses which carried them to their home while in California, Occidental College. All in for pregame barked assistant conductor Jack K. Lee early the next morning as a long day of practice began. The Rose Bowl pregame and halftime shows had been planned on paper. Now they had to be worked out in practice. The drummers worked vigorously, providing the beat which kept the band in step. Dance numbers such as this one to the tune of Some Enchanted Evening were perfected. The bandsmen had to work fast, only three days left before New Year's Day and the Rose Bowl game. 
precision marching done in an atomic bomb sequence was checked by the drum major and twirlers as well as by the band conductors. Another number which took a lot of practice was a wooden soldier's routine. They were all repeated again and again to get them working smoothly. That afternoon, the bandsmen donned their uniforms and boarded buses for the Rose Bowl Stadium and the annual kickoff luncheon. The spacious and picturesque campus at Occidental College was located just outside of Pasadena. Two dormitories vacated for the Christmas holidays by the students provided accommodations for the band. The annual kickoff luncheon was moved out of doors this year so more people could attend, and the occasion gave the Michigan bandsmen their first look at the field where they would later perform on New Year's Day. Professor Ravelli conducted the band and led the crowd in some local California songs. Among the celebrities at the luncheon were the presidents of both universities, Drs. Alexander Ruthven and Robert Sproul. Head coaches Lynn Waldorf and Benny Usterbahn were there, as was the queen of the Tournament of Roses, Eleanor Payne. Red Barber, famous sportscaster, interviewed Michigan's athletic director, Fritz Chrysler. After a box lunch at the stadium, the bandsmen marched out and took one last look. The next time they would see that field would be three days later at the Rose Bowl game. Late the following afternoon, after another day of practice, the band paraded to the Michigan headquarters in downtown Los Angeles to give the West Coast alumni and friends a look at the famous marching group. Early the next morning, assistant conductor Jack Lee started the band working again. This was the last day of practice. Tomorrow was the Tournament of Roses parade, the game, and the big show. Now was the time to get the small details straight. The major work had been accomplished, but now the fine points had to be perfect the little things that would make the difference between a good show and a great one. Position of instruments, marching steps, everything had to be just right. The band worked hard and long, and after practice that day, they were a weary group. Rest and relaxation was the byword that night. Then came New Year's Day, and the show everyone had been pointing for. The long day started early in the morning with the Tournament of Roses Parade. For the majority of people, it meant a spectacle of beauty and wonder. For the Michigan band, it meant a seven-mile march in the parade before the Rose Bowl show. More than a million people lined the streets to watch the band and the spectacular pageantry. At the end of the parade, the bandsmen were able to witness some of the floral beauty and breathtaking floats before going to the Rose Bowl. First was the Queen's float, with the Queen in the royal chair and her six princesses seated below. The Michigan bandsmen also got a look at their friendly competitors for the afternoon, the University of California band. Then came more floats. Michigan band marched on the field for the pregame performance. This was it. This was the big show.
Ben, be seated. The Michigan Minstrels now present Slidin' Sam, featuring the trombone section. Showers in tribute to Mr. Show Business, the late Al Jolson. show wouldn't be complete without a grand chorus to Alexander's ragtime band.
show is over. Rest a while, cheer for the Michigan team, and get set for the halftime performance. Here is what you've been waiting and pointing for, the halftime show. Quite a mystery, but the Michigan band figured it out. There's no need to be spellbound anymore. The thing is Christmas presents for everyone. gift was an old Christmas favorite, a toy electric train. joy of every little girl. And the delight of boys from six to 60.
also a favorite of the boys, is an exciting array of wooden soldiers on parade. wasn't under the Christmas tree was peace. A key factor in achieving peace is the control and use of atomic energy. Atoms have existed since the creation of the Earth, and for more than 2,000 years, man has been attempting to harness these atoms for his use. The greatest strides towards this end have been made in the last 50 years. Bits of information and thousands of discoveries began to be put together. Knowledge was piled upon knowledge until in 1945, a mushroom cloud of smoke. And from that smoke and rubble of Hiroshima and Nagasaki arose fresh hopes for a peaceful world. For with it came plans to control this tremendous source of energy. At the University of Michigan, this plan is called the Phoenix Project, where constructive uses for atomic energy are being sought. Scientists, economists, and sociologists are working together to develop uses for atomic energy to strengthen our America. of American men gave the ultimate in the service of their country. To their honor and glory, this research for peaceful use of atomic energy is dedicated. The goal of a better, fuller life for all mankind is but an extension of the ideals for which these American men laid down their lives. May God bless this land and bring peace on earth. Ladies and gentlemen, that great American ballad, God Bless America.
The job you'd come more than 2,000 miles to do was done and done well. Michigan's football team found itself in the last quarter and won the game. Now the day was a complete success. The bandsmen forgot about sore lips, aching feet, and tired bodies. Newfound enthusiasm and energy burst forth, and the band paraded the field and then marched out of the stadium. The traditional sign of victory, the hats worn backwards, was just another indication of a job well done. Professor Ravelli beamed happily with Waldo McNaught, the public relations director of Buick. It was his execution of Buick's plans that made the trip so enjoyable. Finally, the tired but happy bandsmen boarded buses and went directly to the special Santa Fe train. The big show was a rousing success, but more performances and parades were yet to come. The following day, the train arrived in San Francisco. Dean Walter Ray, faculty business manager of the band, gave each member some dinner money so that after the performance, the bandsmen could see the city and not on an empty stomach. In the morning, they marched down San Francisco's famous Market Street to show the local Californians what the Michigan band could do. Confetti rained down from many of the windows, welcoming the friendly emissaries from the University of Michigan. After the parade, the band went out to the Seals Stadium and performed the pregame and halftime shows there as they were done the day before in the Rose Bowl. The next morning, the band paraded and again performed the Rose Bowl show at Fresno, California. Wherever there's a parade, there's a band, and work and drilling are just as necessary for parades as for a football show. And of course, wherever there's a marching band, there's a drum major and twirlers. The drum major is Dick Smith, a native of West Virginia. One of the twirlers, a national champion in his field, is Floyd Zarbach from Wheaton, Illinois. The other twirler is Sam Zor of Toledo, Ohio. At the Fresno State College Stadium, more than 14,000 people packed the stands. Many of them were high school musicians who were excused from classes that morning to pick up a few tips on how the Michigan band gets things done. An announcer, Press Holmes, who did the continuity for the band's performances, worked on the field instead of in the press box at Fresno. The band did a good job, and the high school musicians expressed their appreciation with vigorous applause. Once again, the bandsmen boarded the special train and began to realize that this western tour was rapidly coming to a close. But there was another thrilling experience the next morning, Grand Canyon. The Michigan football team pulled into Grand Canyon Station shortly after the band train, and the bandsmen played a welcoming salute to the champions of the West. Then the band members set off to explore the awe-inspiring canyon. Some followed a path which ran along the rim, while others took a chartered bus trip to a lookout point a few miles away. After a thorough examination, the bandsmen unanimously agreed that the Grand Canyon lived up to everything that had been said about it. It wasn't always peaceful and friendly, as these recently discovered pictures reveal. feature. The last scheduled stop for the marching band was at Wichita, Kansas. One final parade before winding up the tour which covered more than 5,000 miles and gave the band the nickname of the Transcontinental Michigan Marching Band. On this trip alone, more than three million people saw the band and countless other millions heard their music over national broadcasts a record unsurpassed by any college band. It was a cold and wintry day and brought the bandsmen down out of the clouds and dream world. The balmy breezes and warming sunshine of California were now only memories, only a handful of snapshots and a suitcase full of souvenirs. The majestic Rocky Mountains, 
the days at Occidental College, the Tournament of Roses Parade, the Rose Bowl, Albuquerque, San Francisco, Fresno, Wichita, the Grand Canyon, all now only memories. Vivid memories, however, of a once-in-a-lifetime experience that would not be soon forgotten. More nostalgia while you start making plans to get together on January 1st, 2001, our 50th anniversary. Broadhead were looking at, or what Stowe was doing at the birdbath 